is electric. Hi everyone, welcome back for another energy related video. It's Saturday morning at the end of September. I think it's the last day of September today. Anyway, I thought I'd do a video today about preparing for winter because it is the end of September, summer's over, autumn's here. And there are some things to talk about. There are some things to do and it's because these things are going through my mind, because I'm contemplating them <laughs> randomly throughout the day, I'm starting to think, you know, I should be sharing some of this and sharing the thoughts about what am I thinking? What am I planning to do? How am I gonna optimize things for winter? So that's what this video is about. And the first thing to talk about is tariff. And yeah, I, I rattle on about octopus energy lots and lots, so I'll try and keep it to a minimum. But basically, we all need to look at what our energy use is and how we use it and whether there's a tariff that suits that energy usage better or whether we can change our energy usage like I have. I've changed away from all fossil fuels. I'm now just purely electric and using solar and using the cheapest octopus energy rate. It still amazes me that some people are anti EVs, anti heat pumps, anti anything going electric. And yet then they moan that they've got expensive electric bills and they don't have access to the cheapest tariffs. It's by doing these things, it's by going electric, gives you access to the cheaper tariffs and the cheaper tariffs mean you get cheap electricity for everything else. So for me with Octopus Intelligent, I'm now on a six hour cheap rate energy overnight at seven and a half pence a kilowatt hour. Uh, I mean, in today's market, that's still very, very cheap. My peak rate is 30 pence a kilowatt hour. No, 31 pence a kilowatt hour and 42 pence uh, a day standing charge. That's what I'm paying for. For me, that was the best um, option. And I chose the six hour rate over the go four hour rate, which was really, really tempting to have it more simple. Um, just having a cheap rate for four hours is enough for me. And it was simple. But the six hours and the six hours plus by having some extra slots, by giving access to my charger and electric car so that they can charge when it suits them to make money rather than when it suits me. So long as it's ready in time, I really don't care. So by giving that up, I get some extra slots. Those extra slots that I might get during, let's say daylight hours um, after 6.30 a.m. in the morning, those extra slots will be really useful because if I've already charged my car or charged my home storage battery or heated my hot water, boosted my heating, any of those things in the early hours, if I get extra slots, I can do it during the day as well. So that appeals to me and I'm curious, how many extra slots will I get? How much will it help? Will those extra slots really help me keep off the 31 pence rate of electricity and keep me on just 7.5 pence? So my my strategy for the winter is to try and use the least amount of peak rate energy as possible and try and keep my energy bill as low as possible. So my starting point, what did we do last year? So from sep the end of September through to uh, the end of March, so six months of energy usage, last year we used 2,100 kilowatt hours. 97% of that was the 7.5 pence rate because last year I was on the GO tariff and it was 7.5 pence. So my actual cheap rate hasn't changed uh, in the last year. So if I do the math on the 2,100 kilowatt hours at cheap rate and the 60 or 70 of that at the peak rate, then last year I only had an energy bill for six months of 246 pounds. So that includes charging electric cars, that includes heating hot water, cooking, heating as well, because I had electric heating systems. I used the oil boiler very, very little just for testing last year. We do have a wood burner as well, and I used that a fair amount last year. That's one of the changes I intend to make this year. But that's our starting point price-wise and the number of kilowatt hours, what we did last year. Anyway, solar, what's gonna happen with solar? I haven't added any new panels in the last year, so I still have 9.2 kilowatts peak power of solar panels connected through 8.1 kilowatts of inverter power. That gives me a maximum actual usable power of about 7.4 kilowatts when it's a really sunny day with a little bit of cloud in May and June. So it's the perfect um, conditions for solar. 7.4 kilowatts is my max over winter. I'll be lucky to see five, five and a half, um, because the sun is lower, it's less powerful. So I'm not expecting to see uh, great high levels of solar. 
If you look at this chart, you'll see that there is a really big drop off. So September now it's reduced over from peak summer, October is going to reduce again, but then November, December, January just disappears. The sun is so low that uh, we know we have a hillside just out there <laughs> in Norfolk, a hillside and a few trees. The sun is so low that it's just not catching the panels. So solar is going to be negligible because the number of daylight hours and the angle of the sun is just so low. But at some point during October, there's not going to be enough solar energy to recharge our home storage batteries and charge our electric cars, heat our hot water and do all of those things. So at some point in October, it's going to be obvious that we need to start doing some of those things from the grid because there's not enough solar energy for it. What day that is? Well, I guess that's that's the guess mark, isn't it? That's the fun. When's it going to happen? Um, I estimated in a previous video that it was going to be mid-October. Unbelievably, mid-September, I've already been charging the car um, from the grid. We've had some dull days and also I've been testing and trying out Octopus Intelligent. So my idea, my plan of trying to get through to the mid-October before we use the grid energy hasn't worked at all. But what do I do when that happens? When I get to the point where I need to do some charging, am I going to plan to charge a little bit? I've got six hours, a six hour window where I can charge the home storage battery on cheap rate energy overnight with Octopus Intelligent. And then the electric cars and the hot water and boosting the heating, all of those things. I've got a six hour window to use cheap rate energy. But I don't need six hours because Four hours is enough for me. Six hours at 3.6 kilowatts charging our home storage battery. That's the maximum charging power it can draw. That's 20, that's 21.6 kilowatt hours. And yet my battery is only 17 point something kilowatt hours of capacity. Electric car, both of our electric cars, um, one's 32 kilowatt hours usable, the other's 29 kilowatt hours usable. So at a peak rate of seven kilowatts in the cheap rate period and six hours of that, that's 42 kilowatt hours. Again, that's more than what I need. So I don't actually need the six hour window. So should I configure it, for example, from 11.30 till 1.30 in the morning and have a two hour slot where I charge the cars and do, do the home battery charging, then have two hours on the grid again and then have a further two hours, 3.30 in the morning till 5.30 in the morning, the cheap rate, to get that period as close to possible as sunrise, etc., so that the batteries and cars are all topped up at the last minute. Should I do that and just use four hours out of the six, trying to keep my numbers down, trying to keep the grid import down? And yet what I learned from previous years is it feels good to try and do that, to try and keep the numbers low for the numbers sake and no other reason really. It's not saving a lot of money. At seven and a half pence a kilowatt hour, you might as well just leave it um, charging in that entire six hour period. So my experience and testing previously just says, if it's cheap rate, set the home storage battery to charge up during those six hours. So basically the battery is off for those six hours. That means I can be completely flexible inside that six hour period about whether I'm charging the car, whether I'm heating hot water, whether I'm heating the house, doing any of those things, and I'm not gonna accidentally draw from the battery. What I don't wanna do is draw some from the grid and then accidentally draw some more from the battery, which means I've gotta retop up the battery because I'm just wasting energy going in and out and all the conversions from AC to DC. So I only wanna do those things once. So all of those complications like I don't know, it just confuses your head, trying to get your head around it, trying to think about it all, trying to be conscious of it without having to write down your strategy and those sort of things. And it's not a, it's not a small thing. It's, it's quite a lot of data and quite a lot of planning and thought that goes around your head. So for me, I try to keep it really, really simple. And, and that's what I've learned. So when I get to that period where that's it, I now have to draw from the grid, that when that day happens, I will set my Victron inverter to turn off and turn into charging mode at 11.30 at night and carry on all the way through until 5.30 in the morning, the six hour window. And therefore, even though it's fully charged several hours before, it'll still be off. It won't be supporting the grid. That gives me that flexibility of the six hours. But if I charge my home storage battery and my electric cars and heat my hot water and do all of that in the 7.5 pence cheap rate period, then everything's full, everything's ready. So what's gonna to happen to any excess solar? Because the sun does shine on some days during that six month period. 
So at what point am I going to leave some capacity to use the solar energy so I'm not just exporting it? Because I'm not on an export tariff where I get paid for what I export. And I'll cover the reasons for that and what's going on with that in another video. But for the moment, you just have to accept that I don't get paid for export. So for me, consuming solar energy is still reasonably important. It'd be wasteful otherwise to pay seven and a half pence for a kilowatt hour when I'm gonna get it for free later. So trying to judge it so that I'm not exporting too much is still a thing, a thing I want to do. The ideal is to have some spare capacity for charging from solar and that I'm gonna automatically have because of that cheap rate window ending at 5.30 and the sun might not be up until say nine o'clock, 9.30 in the morning. So I've got four hours of running from the battery, it's gonna be drained down. I need to charge it back up again. But the big one for me is hot water. I like leaving some hot water capacity to use up any solar excess. So for us with the Mixergy hot water tank, because it's only heating the percentage of hot water that you want to the right temperature, not the whole tank to the right temperature, then I can boost it for say quarter of an hour on cheap rate energy, and that will give me 50, 52, 54 degree temperature hot water. And if I have that boost to be just enough, then it's just enough for what we need first thing in the morning. And then as solar occurs during the day, it'll top it back up again and it'll boost us and we'll have more 50 degree plus hot water throughout the day. So for me, it's about timing that boost and sizing that boost so it's enough, but not too much to draw from um, the grid and also not to waste solar energy. So I probably will be changing how we handle hot water. In the summer, it's a free for all. There's so much solar that we heat the tank to 100% and we're full of hot water all the time. In the winter, there's no point in heating the entire tank if I'm not gonna use it. So I might as well heat it from the grid say 20 to 30% and leave 70% of the tank as capacity to heat up from solar if solar exists. And if it doesn't and I get it wrong, then all I've got to do is boost it for five minutes and we've got hot water. So it's a very flexible system, the Mixergy tank. It means I can run a very low level of hot water, but still have hot water at the right temperature. And that does work really well. That's been proven in previous years. How long have I had the Mixergy tank now? A year, two years? I, I really can't remember. But anyway, that's our strategy. The solar excess will go to hot water and to topping up the batteries as well. So I'm going with my previous experience, which is keep it simple, use the entire window, charge everything up, and then use the battery topping up and the hot water topping up to cover the solar excess. That's it. The rest of the energy coming from solar will go to the house load and heating that they'll be running all the time as well. So that'll all be coming for free from solar hopefully, and when there's no solar, it'll be draining the battery. Now, as I saw last year, we didn't use any peak rate energy, so the battery never ran out at all. I never got to the point where the battery was empty and we were just drawing from the grid on peak rate energy. So I'm hoping for the same again this year, with a six hour window, some extra slots from Octopus Intelligent, and all that I've learned, hopefully I'll get it right and we won't have to use peak rate energy and keep the bills really, really low. Heating then, so I need to plan around our heating system and what we're doing with heating. And as you know, we've got a hybrid heating system here. So we don't have a central heating system that covers every single room. I've gone for an air-to-air -air heat pump system, which is air conditioning units for the majority of our house. So the lounge, the mouse bedroom, the hallways, the center core of the house is heated with a heat pump. So very cheap energy, very cheap electricity usage that I'm still getting two to one, maybe three to one during that winter period. Um, COP value, so every kilowatt hour that I'm paying for, I'm getting two or three or more kilowatt hours of heat come out of it. So that's a very productive system and that's the basis of our heating system here. Our wet rooms, our bathrooms are covered by little immersion heaters, 300 watt immersion heaters in towel rails, so radiators, so they're not connected anymore to the boiler system. So I don't need to turn the oil boiler on at all. So all of our bathrooms are covered by those. Plus then I've added a couple of um, electric radiators and infrared heaters. So for where it's not a wet room where I don't need a towel rail on or where it's say a guest bedroom that I don't need heat on all the time, then those can be covered by a more portable or a single heating source. So it's not worth spending lots and lots of money 
on a heating system to heat those rooms, it is more productive to he keep the heating off until you actually need it for those few days when a, a guest is there, etc. So infrared, for me, works brilliantly for that. So I've been looking at the infrared panels and trying to work out what I want to do by adding more because I've really enjoyed having the infrared panel in our cloakroom downstairs. So we're looking at having one upstairs in either uh, one of the bedrooms or uh, one of the bathrooms upstairs. So the panel we've chosen is from Surya Heating, um, S-U-R-Y-A heating.co.uk. They're part of the Mirrorstone group, which do things like electric lights, electric bikes, and these infrared panels. There's quite a few um, different brands and different companies all within this Mirrorstone group. So that appeals, there's a one-stop shop and it looks like you know they're doing just the things that I want. The brochure has got lots of choice, um, got aluminium framed panels, black aluminium framed, or glass mirror panels, or custom picture panels. We can put your own picture on the, uh, on the panel as well. So there's lots of ways of making these infrared panels blend into your home and look attractive because that's what I've enjoyed about getting rid of the oil boiler, getting rid of radiators. They're really ugly. So to have a mirror on the wall that is also a heater or to have a picture on the wall that's also a heater is much better than just a radiator that doesn't do anything else than just sit there and take space and, in my view, look ugly. And uh, quality wise, so far, I've only had it for a couple of weeks now and uh, it just does the job. The one that I've got um, doesn't have any thermostatic controls with it. It's just on and off, but that's what I want. I'm gonna plug it into a power source, put it on a smart socket and have it go on and off um, through automation, either just timers on a smart plug or actually with um, automation looking at temperatures and turning it off when the temperature gets to the right level in the room. One of the great things about going electric is the oil tank that we've got here is basically nearly empty and we can almost get rid of it. So we're down to the last 100 litres. I've been siphoning it and giving it to a friend. So their oil tank is full. They're getting this for free. And uh, as soon as they've used another 100 litres, we'll siphon off the last 100 litres and give that to them. So I'm looking forward to getting rid of the oil tank. I want the space back in my garden. My plan, as per previous years, is to boost the heating overnight. So in that cheap rate period, we'll be boosting the house temperature up to 21, 22, 23 degrees, something like that. And then turning the temperature down for the period from then through lunchtime. Because that's typically when we'll take the dog for a walk, do other things. We don't mind the house cooling a little bit. And then we'll re-warm re it back up again at um, about lunchtime ready for the evening and then run it through the evening until a point um, where the house starts to need to cool down. So we prefer it that we have cooler bedrooms upstairs so we'll time it so that we have not 21 degrees but probably 18, 19 degrees upstairs. So timing that, when to have the heating on, when to have it off is just about being comfortable and having the heating how we want it. It's not about saving energy but there's no point having the heating going absolutely continuously unless there's an excess of energy, unless we're very comfortable with our battery, etc., and there's some sunshine outside. Otherwise, we might as well turn it off when we don't actually need it because the house retains the heat quite well. It doesn't plummet down quickly and then we waste a lot of energy refiring up the heating, etc. So that's the plan for the heating and the heaters, the independent infrared and the independent radiators, those are the first things to go off. It's the air source heat pump, the air to air, air conditioning units. Those are the ones that stay on the longest and will use most heat from. Last year, as I said at the beginning of the video, we do have a log burner as well and we used that a fair amount last year. My plan this year is to use it less. So I'm expecting our electricity bill to rise um, as we use less wood burning in our wood stove and more just greener electric heating. So over time, I'm hoping to wean myself off having a log burner at all. I'm hoping to de-implement it at some point, but I'm just not quite ready to do that yet. This year will be a good <laughs> test. Um, I said I wasn't gonna be doing testing, but probably that's the area where I'll be testing myself to see can I let go of the log burner and to what degree. So with that in mind, how are we going to do? What are our predictions for 2023-24, that six month winter period? Again, last year, 2,100 units of electricity is what we used in that period. Um, 1,158 kilowatt hours, so 55% of that energy was just heating. 
Um, obviously it wasn't all just from the grid pool. Some of that was from solar energy, etc. in that six month period. But 1158 kilowatt hours was our six month usage of heating and 2100 kilowatt hours was what we drew from the grid, plus obviously what we got through solar. So that's our starting point. What I'll be doing um, in the next few weeks is looking at the base load of the house to get that down. In summer, we're a little bit more excessive. You now I've got a second fridge on. We use that as a beer fridge. So that's excessive, I don't need to do that. Lots of things are just left on and left on on standby because there's plenty of battery resources, there's plenty of solar, it just doesn't matter. But in winter, it's easy to turn things off. It's not difficult to have things on timers to go off completely. So um, I've been looking at things like our internet routers. I had added a mesh router system to try and get better Wi-Fi in the house. But now we've changed from talk, talk broadband across to plus net fiber. Um, we're finding that the router is more powerful, so I don't need those mesh routers anymore. So I've taken two mesh routers out, that's 20 watts. 20 watts running continuously over 24 hours is half a kilowatt hour. So just that one change, removing a couple of items that are no longer plugged in, is saving some good energy. But there's a few things I can do to keep reducing down our energy usage to conserve battery, etc., and to keep my numbers low. So anyway, on to predictions. Um, so let's have a look at stats and the numbers. If my usage of grid import increases from 2,100 to say 3,000 kilowatt hours, and we use 95% at the cheap rate and just 5% um, at the expensive rate, then the cost for that would be 213 pounds for the cheap rate energy, 45 pounds for the expensive energy, and 75 pounds for the new standing charge, a total of 333 pounds compared to 246 last year, so £100 increase. But yeah, I mean, if that's my prediction, 3,000 kilowatt hours, am I going to use 1,000 kilowatt hours or 900 kilowatt hours more um, through not using the oil boiler at all and using the log burner less? Is that a reasonable guess? I think that's what I'm going with. I'm going with 3,000 as my target. Um, I don't want to go too much over that. But if we stayed the same, if we stayed at 2,100 kilowatt hours and used exactly as we used last year, then that would be 150 pounds for the cheap rate energy, 30 pounds for the peak rate energy, and again, 75 pounds for the standing charge, which I can't avoid. And that comes to 255 pounds. So if we use the same amount of energy roughly as last year, our energy bill will actually be pretty much similar within 10 pounds to last year's. So it, most of that is just the standing charge increase because again, we've kept cheap rate energy at seven and a half pence as it was last year. And we're actually gaining more hours of that. So we're in a much more comfortable position of not running out of battery power because we've got those six hours instead of four hours where we're charging the battery. And also I've only got to get to 11.30 at night before we can start charging the battery. Whereas under the GO tariff, I had to wait till 2.30 in the morning, an extra three hours. We should do that more comfortably. So I think we're definitely not gonna run out of battery power this year, which starts to make me think about battery size. I mean, I'd love to have it add another five kilowatt hours, another 10 kilowatt hours of battery storage. I mean, who wouldn't? But if I'm now on Octopus Intelligent with six hours, and that means we're less likely to run out, I probably don't need any extra battery. It's, it's a bit of a whim wanting that extra power when I don't need it. So it's going to be very interesting to see and compare things like the state of charge level. How low are we going to go on the battery for how many days over winter compared to last year? How much better is it going to be because of this extra two hours that we've got and the timing from 11.30 at night through 5.30 in the morning? That's gonna be really interesting to see whether we improve based on that new tariff. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed these videos and uh, can't wait to share more with you end of the month. So end of the month stats coming soon. Plus I must do that video on why I don't have a smart export guarantee scheme yet. Why am I not exporting and being paid for it? Because that makes sense as well. Anyway, take care. See you again soon for more videos. Bye for now.